Hello everyone. My name is, as Richard said, Charlie Weinberg. I am lucky enough to be the chair of the Centre for Crime and Justice Studies. I'm also the director of a service delivery organisation in the UK called Safe Ground. I have 30 years experience working in criminal justice and social justice across the UK and internationally. This is the first of three of these events. It's the first time we have been online with quite so many people. So do bear with us and be kind. When we were planning these events, we were in the midst of a global pandemic. Since then, the crisis has continued to increase and I don't think any of us quite foresaw the context that we'd be in today. And I think this is an opportunity for us and all of you in the audience to really think about the structural design, the fundamentals of justice, as well as the people that are subjects to criminal justice. This is an opportunity for us globally to start thinking perhaps about how justice is structured and perceived. So to help us do that, we have four panellists and I will introduce them one by one. They are each going to speak for up to 10 minutes. I will be keeping very strict time. They're all aware of that. No one will go over. And then what we're aiming to do at the end of all of those presentations is really engage you, the audience, in a conversation. So the Q&A function is really important. Please do send questions, comments. We will be collating them. And even if you're not named directly and I don't ask a question attached to you, what I'm hoping to do is be able to collate themes and broad concepts that the panel and yourselves can then get into discussion about. I can't guarantee that everyone's going to get their particular question answered individually. We have amongst our participants, and I know people are going to continue to join as we start, people from Australia, China, Poland, Germany, Hong Kong, the Philippines. I know we've got people from Forensics, uh, in, uh, Independent Monitoring Board, the Traveller Movement. I know we've got some journalists. We've got some human rights activists. We've got some parole board members. We've got prison teachers. We've got interpreters. We've got lawyers. We've got artists. We've got all sorts of people involved in work within and outside the justice system and we're really hoping to hear as many of those voices and ideas as possible. So without further ado and as long as I haven't forgotten anything really important, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Fergus McNeil, who is probably known to most people. He is currently the director at the Scottish Centre for Crime and Justice Research, and I'm really keen to hear what you've got to say, Fergus. Thank you. I'm actually not director. I'm an associate director, but not the director. <laughs> That's Ali Fraser. Um, okay, well, thank you very much for the invitation to, to be part of this event. I'm looking forward to the discussion very much, and I'm going to set us off conceptually um, and then talk through some issues in relation to social distancing as it affects probably probation more than prisons, but um, maybe rehabilitation in, in, a, in a broader uh, sense. So distance and proximity uh, are words that have suddenly become central to the way that we're all having to live our lives as we respond to the, the crisis that the pandemic brings. But they're also familiar words used often metaphorically in the context of criminal justice. And so think about this for a moment. If, if we think about crime, crime involves unwelcome proximities. Um, so the invasion of bodily space or uh, an inappropriate intrusion that affects uh, personal property, for example. Um, and punishment also involves unwelcome proximities, both policing and punishment indeed as tragic events, uh, infuriating events in America recently um, underline unwelcome proximities uh, that involve abuses of power um, are, are part of what happens uh, within the context of criminal justice too. At the same time, crime and punishment also create distance between people. They fracture and break social relations. They push people apart, both at the level of interpersonal relations and systemically 
particularly in the practice of imprisonment. So that's a, a separating and a distancing practice. And I think the first time I ever came across the word social distance, or the phrase social distance rather, was when I was training to be a social worker. And those that were training me were discussing social distance as a problem for the worker seeking to establish the rapport on which um, any constructive, positive engagement and intervention in the lives of somebody going through the criminal justice system would depend. And so I was taught that as a social worker, it was my job to try to bridge the social distance, to, to recognize it, to identify it, and to try to bridge the social distance between me and the client or the service user. And indeed, if you think about any practice of rehabilitation, any practice of reintegration, or any practice of restorative um, uh, justice, then bridging distance, making a connection to people, arriving at an appropriate measure of proximity is what we're aiming for um, often. So social distancing then as a pandemic response creates obvious problems in the pursuit of justice. Um, it also creates opportunities. So the first opportunity is the opportunity to decarcerate. And I know that uh, in England and Wales, the situation uh, is disappointing in that respect. In Scotland, the pandemic has produced uh, a drop in the prison population of about an eighth so far. So we've, our population has dropped from 8,000 to 700. Um, that, that's a precipitate drop, an unprecedented drop. Um, we finally achieved something that our policy has been claiming to pursue for a decade, but without much success. And it's been achieved not through early release schemes, although we have um, on the last available data released about 350 people through COVID related early release. Rather, it's been achieved by the slowing down of court business. Now, of course, that creates a problem. It means that as soon as the courts get up and operating again at their ordinary pace, that decarceration might be rapidly reversed, but it need not be so. And I'll come back to that at the end. I want to talk briefly um, in the time that remains about how the experience of being supervised and the practice of being supervised in the community as part of the criminal justice system has been changed by social distancing in particular. And I've, I've written a blog about this, which people can refer to if they wish, published by the Centre, the Scottish Centre for Crime and Justice Research. So the first change in working practice, obviously, is that uh, in most uh, supervisory relationships now, physical uh, proximity is uh, prohibited. And so a great deal of supervision is taking place through phones or drive-by modalities of supervision. And I'll come on to the problems that that creates for supervisees, for people under supervision in a minute. For, for practitioners, it creates another set of issues of unwelcome proximity. So just as all of us are experiencing, well, most of us, I guess, right now, work is at home um, and home is a place of work. But in the context of labor, which is emotionally demanding and which involves engagement with complex and distressing questions and issues, that proximity um, has a particular salience. So probation staff at this time might be moving between homeschooling at one point and speaking to somebody threatening self-harm or threatening to harm another person or reading distressing papers in their home environment. And so the, the emotional impacts of labouring in these new ways have to be thought through carefully. At the same time, those staff are trying to maintain the right kind of proximity with the people that they're supervising through phone calls or teleconferencing or the, the same kinds of technologies that we're using here. And from what I hear from staff and from a few people subject to supervision, those conversations sometimes center on mutual care, the, the addressing of basic needs, but at other times they are stilted, difficult, fractured, unsatisfying conversations where proximity is so difficult to sustain in the absence of the usual nonverbal cues and the other uh, ordinary business of human interaction uh, in physical space. So that creates a risk that those interactions default to something superficial and something surve surveillant, merely surveillant. And rehabilitative work, the work that, that, that is seeking to constructively engage with the individual becomes more difficult to achieve 
subject to the forms of mediation that we're currently experiencing. So just as I'm trying to talk to you and we're going to try to establish a dialogue here, it's stilted. It's not natural. It's not uh, possible for us to enter into conversation in the way that we might in the room. So for me, uh, rehabilitative practices are at their heart dialogical practices. And when dialogue has to be mediated through technology, certain uh, challenges are obviously created. Now, if I move on to thinking briefly about how supervision might be experienced under these conditions, we know that people in approved premises, for example, in England, are coming out of prison, maybe sometimes coming out from long sentences, and find, finding themselves effectively detained in approved premises where social distancing protocols confine them to their rooms and restrict their movement beyond their rooms in line with uh, the restrictions that the whole population has suffered. Now, when I wrote the blog, that was a month ago, which was before England uh, fairly rapidly um, uh, lifted some of the lockdown restrictions. So obviously my information already is out of date. In the Scottish context, we're moving much more slowly in relation to the lifting of those restrictions and the degree of human interaction that we are permitted at the moment. But it's far from normal in either jurisdiction yet. And in these circumstances, and also in supervision more generally, we can ask whether the pains of being supervised, which have been studied by various researchers in recent uh, years, have been ameliorated or exacerbated by their mediation through digital technology. So thinking about this positively, you might think, well, at least if I'm only having to speak to my supervisor on the phone or through uh, Zoom conferencing or whatever other technology, I might be able to sustain a slightly greater degree of privacy. And I also avoid the costs, both time costs and financial costs of getting to an office to be interviewed. So there are some, potentially some basic advantages, but fundamentally the communication difficulties that I've already alluded to um, and the difficulties of making yourself understood through these media um, apply as much to supervisees as they do to supervisors. And privacy issues, just as the invasion of work into the life space of the probation practitioner is an issue that we should be concerned about. Similarly, probation practice is invading the life space of the supervisee through the technology that's being deployed to try to sustain relationships. And again, that may have pros and cons. So I'm going to finish by just addressing a few principles that we might use to kind of pick our way through this uh, ethically and hopefully effectively. And I, I'm drawing these principles from the final chapter of a book I published a year or two back called Pervasive Punishment, which uh, studied the development of supervision, um, mass supervision in the UK and the USA. And the principles that I set at the end of that book are principles of parsimony, proportionality and productiveness. So restraining the uh, use of supervision, restraining the demands of supervision and where we must use supervision, uh, designing it and undertaking it in ways which are uh, productive for the individuals concerned and for society. And productiveness uh, it requires or entails three further principles. One is the principle of legitimacy. So ensuring that the process of supervision is experienced as one which is fair and procedurally just, that's difficult. If you think about the dynamics of sustaining legitimacy within the context of digitally mediated communication, again, the, the subtle uh, dynamics of human interaction, the, the reading of one another, which is possible face to face and harder through the phone or through the screen, um, that creates real challenges for sustaining legitimate relationships with supervisees. Um, the second principle is that the practices have to be helpful, practically helpful to those subject to that authority. And that comes into particularly sharp relief where people under supervision have significant health problems or uh, problems of social disadvantage, which are likely to be exacerbated in the pandemic. And the third restriction uh, or the third principle of productiveness is that these intrusions into people's lives have to be time limited. Um, so I think there might be a, a risk that in the, in the attempt to decarcerate, politicians seek to toughen up community sanctions, particularly through the application of technology like tagging. 
and, and also potentially through the extension of periods to of supervision to which people are subject. And I think that's exactly the wrong way to go. We should not be intensifying the demands of supervision. Um, we should not be allowing it to become merely surveillance. And we should not be allowing it to be becoming a more detached, distanced and alienating practice than it needs to be even under these, some, these circumstances. So those are the dynamics that we have to work against in policy and practice if we are to sustain uh, the potential productiveness of supervisory relationships even in a pandemic. I'll stop there. Thanks Fergus. Um, I wrote down loads of things but I think the idea of the invasion of personal space and the, the unwelcome proximities between home and work is really interesting in the idea of who supervises the supervisors and what kind of clinical or informal supervision our practitioners receiving in these conditions is really interesting and little spoken about um, and the, the contradictions of all the emotional labour. I know we've had one question from the audience so far about remote hearings which I think we'll come back to um, and how can we how can we ensure effective support and skills development so I know Safe Ground during this period of time have set up reflective groups open to practitioners and members of the public from across the country precisely to try and address some of these missing spaces um, and I know that also say, uh, CCJS will be sending out a follow-up email after the event and I know you've shared a, a link to your blog further so we'll be putting that out for all participants um, and the proximity being difficult to sustain has kind of stayed with me from all you shared thank you I am going to ask now our next speaker with a particular perspective on court, John Collins, the Chief Executive of the Magistrates Association, to take control of the mic. Thanks, John. Thanks very much, Charlie, and thank you very much to the CCJS and the Open University for putting on today's event and for inviting me to speak. Um, as Charlie said, I'm the Chief Executive of the Magistrates Association, and I've been asked just to talk a bit about what's been happening in magistrates' courts over the last 10 weeks or so. So first of all, I'm just going to briefly describe what has actually happened, and apologies to those of you who already know this. And I'm just going to highlight what I think are three of the key issues that have arisen, and some of them overlap with some of the issues that, that Fergus has already raised. So in terms of what happened, first of all, I think when the extent and the severity of the pandemic became apparent, the first step was to substantially reduce the flow of cases coming to magistrates' courts with only the most urgent cases, primarily overnight police custody cases and productions from prisons, but also, for example, urgent applications for restraining orders or domestic violence protection orders were coming to court. They were largely done remotely where possible, with the Emergency Coronavirus Act enabling almost all court hearings to take place using video or audio links. All other work that would normally be taking place in magistrates' courts and all the jury trials in the Crown Court, has been, as has been covered extensively in the media, were put on hold. The remaining work was then consolidated into fewer buildings, with less than half of, of the courts in England and Wales open for those essential face-to-face -face hearings. This first phase was therefore a period of rapid contraction, limiting the amount of cases coming through courts, limiting the number of people who had to come into courthouses, with the intention of enabling social distancing. But as Fergus mentioned in his presentation, this is therefore to a backlog of cases to be dealt with. I'll come back to that in a minute. More recently, this period of contraction has begun to be unwound. More courts are sitting, more cases are being heard, and we're anticipating that more magistrates' courts will reopen in the coming weeks. As a result, a much broader range of cases are being heard, and trials are now starting to take place again in the magistrates' courts and slowly in the Crown Courts, albeit with significantly fewer listed than would normally be the case. So again, limit the number of people who are attending courthouses. Where possible, video technology is still being used, with the court service having rolled out a new video platform. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. Finally, the single justice procedure, which sees a single magistrate supported by a legal advisor dealing with low-level cases in private, is now being done online from home for the first time. So that, in a nutshell, is what's been happening. What are the implications? I think there are three areas that I want to mention. The first, as I already alluded to in my introduction, is around delays and a backlog. The decision to minimise the number of cases coming through the court has inevitably led to justice for some individuals, both defendants and victims, being delayed, 
this is regrettable. We've all heard the aphorism, justice delayed is justice denied. But in our view, it was and is acceptable, given the, acceptable circum the exceptional circumstances, to delay the bulk of those cases taking place. As a result, though, there is a backlog of cases developing. And while crime overall has been down during lockdown, so the backlog isn't as big as it would have been if you cut if you closed almost all the courts in normal circumstances, there is now a significant number of cases that will need to be brought to court as quickly as possible. So we will need to consider how best to prioritise the delayed cases to ensure the most urgent cases are dealt with most quickly. This has to include cases where the defendant has been remanded in custody or is subject to very restrictive bail conditions. And I think cases involving children or young people are also likely to be among the most important to deal with promptly. So as the courts start operating again, as the courts start getting to move, moving again, I think we need to think carefully about which cases we prioritise to ensure that we can get those cases through as quickly as possible. Addressing this will require working at maximum capacity, potentially over quite an extended period. There's no avoiding the fact this is much more difficult in a situation where the whole system was running right at the edge of capacity and potentially beyond before any of this started. So among other issues, there's a shortage of magistrates, a shortage of legal advisors, and the closure of half of all the magistrates' courts in the last decade I mean there was much less flexibility in the system than there would have been otherwise. It will be difficult to ramp up capacity quickly. Nonetheless, magistrates are keen to pull their weight in getting the system operating again. And as it becomes possible over the coming months, we certainly expect courts to be running at their maximum capacity to clear the backlog. The second issue I wanted to raise briefly is around video links and remote participation, which is something that Fergus mentioned in a different context. In normal times, the MA is sceptical at best about the use of phone or video links because of the impact they, their use can have on fair participation. We did support greater use of remote hearings in the current situation to reduce unnecessary contact and potential transmission of coronavirus. But it's still been concerning to hear there have been issues with defendants being able to fully engage with the process. The challenges with enabling the press and public to access video hearings have also been highlighted. Despite, I think it's important to say this, the court service making a real effort to make that possible. Still, elements of open justice have had to be compromised in order to enable people to, to participate by video. I think it's also important to recognise in this context that, as Fergus mentioned, there are people who are appearing from home as witnesses or potentially in time as defendants, but also magistrates sit in the family jurisdiction. And again, you have, here, you have parties in those hearings and magistrates all taking part in potentially quite distressing and serious hearings from home. You don't have that separation between your home life and your work life. And I think that has implications both for people taking part in the hearings and for magistrates and legal advisors who are managing them. This issue may be particularly important as a much greater use of live links for court hearings is planned as part of the current court reform programme in the future. We've long had concerns about this and its implications for quality of justice and the evidence there is around the use of video links remains unconvincing, I think it's fair to say. And we're therefore concerned that where things have been introduced under these current emergency conditions, when there has been a needs must element to the discussion, which we recognise the importance of, once the situation is returned to normal, they'll continue to be used. And there will inevitably be a temptation to retain emergency measures, especially where they've resulted in financial savings. And it may, it may be, of course, that the current circumstances will lead to some changes in practice that are actually beneficial. It may be there are some procedural hearings just carried out by lawyers where there's no defendants or parties present that are better done remotely without everyone having to traipse the whole way across the country. But I think we need to be very careful in looking at any changes that have been introduced during this period before they become permanent to make sure they're not compromising the quality of justice and to make sure that defendants and maybe particularly vulnerable defendants are still able to participate fully in any hearing that, that directly affects them. The third and, and final issue which I want to raise briefly is around remand and sentencing decisions that are being made in court during the current situation. Looking at remands first, courts do need to consider the fact that defendants who are remanded are likely to spend longer periods of time in custody than normal due to the delays that are growing in the system. We also need to recognise that it may be more challenging than in normal circumstances to put in place an effective bail package, as relevant services are frequently unavailable. So these are complicated decisions that courts are having to make about bail and remand. And it is worth noting, I think, in this context, that no additional guidance is being issued to sentences on remand. So they're making decisions using the same tests and considerations that they would do in normal circumstances. 
when it comes to sentencing, judges and magistrates should already always take into account the impact of any court order on the individual and potentially on others, including family members. Given the inherent risk of transmission of coronavirus in prisons or other custodial institutions, and the very limited regimes that can be provided at the moment by prisons, and we've heard that people are locked up um, potentially almost 23, 24 hours a day. Um, I think that needs to be recognised that the impact of custody may be more serious than normal. This was set out in a letter to all magistrates from the senior, senior presiding judge on the 7th of April, which noted that judges and magistrates can and should keep in mind that the impact of a custodial sentence is likely to be heavier during the present emergency than it would be otherwise. And a subsequent appeal judgment for the Lord Chief Justice made similar points. Given this, you would expect where the courts are operating, custodial sentences given at the moment to be shorter than they would normally be, and for these issues to be considered when determining whether a custodial sentence is unavoidable. It is also worth noting though, I think, and, and Fergus mentioned this in passing, that many potential elements of community orders, like unpaid work or programme requirements, are also likely to be unavailable in the immediate future. So even where an offender is given a community order, it may be longer before they can start it, and therefore longer before they can complete it. And they may therefore be under probation supervision with all the impacts that has on them for longer periods. And as Fergus said, much of that may be done remotely, and that has benefits as it has benefits for court users. But it also brings on particular pressures in terms of the interactions they have with the person supervising them, as it does with the court. Um, so that's been a very quick tour through what I think is going on in magistrates' courts, and I think what some of the key issues are. I think that many of the issues that Fergus raised around the limitations of face-to-face -face interactions, the benefits of social distancing for health reasons, but the potential challenges for practice, apply also to magistrates' courts, both to magistrates themselves and to defendants, and particularly on the interactions between them and the way that they see each other in courts and the impact that may have on fairness and on procedural justice. So I think they're really important issues for the courts to consider, both now during the pandemic, and particularly as we think about what changes that have been foreseen in the last couple of months might be made permanent. Thank you. Brilliant, John. Thank you very much indeed. And I suppose um, coming off the back of what Fergus said, the idea of people being involved in court hearings, magistrates being involved in court hearings from home, and again, that blurring of boundaries that's been mentioned by the audience was quite stark. Um, the massive backlog of cases that you've described, the issues arising for people on remand, what, what is that going to mean for people on remand, that were on remand before the virus and that have been on remand since, already being at maximum capacity and having huge staff shortages, and uh, from the audience has come the idea of the danger, I think you've raised it as well, of, of virtual hearings starting to substitute for real life face-to-face -face procedures. Um, which is a common issue across criminal justice in terms of family visits at prisons, for example. So thank you very much indeed for that. I know it's difficult to get so much knowledge, expertise and experience into 10 minutes. It's a big ask. And audience is starting to come forward with ideas, both from Fergus's talk and now from John's. How can practitioners be combining forces with, with legal practitioners to push back against this idea of increasingly punitive approaches. Um, and how, how is the criminal justice system going to cope with the shielding and medical needs of people so often involved, disproportionately exposed to coronavirus and disproportionately involved in the criminal justice system? So keep the Q&A going. Please use your thumbs up to push interesting questions that you want answered or asked towards the top of the list. And I am delighted to hand over now to John Podmore, currently professor, visiting professor, professor and or visiting professor at Durham University, a writer, an author, an ex-prison governor. And John, you have... 10 minutes thank you yeah thank you charlie thank you richard yeah uh, honorary professor at durham again and delighted to, to to be there um social distancing and prisons i think ironically part of the problem with prisons is that they as institutions have been socially distant for, for far too long um in terms of social distancing during a pandemic yeah that's something i want to uh 
to reflect on. But I think that the pandemic in prison is, is more about what we don't know than and can't explain rather than what we do. I think everyone's in agreement that prisons are a perfect petri dish for this virus and indeed any other. Uh, we know prisons are unhygienic, they're overcrowded, people have got poor physical and mental health and an increasing number of, uh, of, of elderly uh, prisoners. But preventative measures that we're uh, instructed to do, personal hygiene, social distancing, um, largely impossible in a, in a prison setting, I, I would suggest. So the predictions worldwide, uh, and, and from me as well, were that there'd be widespread infection among staff and prisoners and there'd be many hospitalizations and many deaths. Um, and it was these arguments, quite reasonably, um, put by many organisations and by me, um, that in order to reduce these risks, then we need to reduce the prison population to at least begin to allow for some kind of isolation, social distancing, so on and so forth, for at least those who are the most vulnerable. Um, now, some institutions, some um, uh, jurisdictions have, been, have released a number of prisoners um, in the UK, they were talking about 4,000. Well, that ran into the sand fairly early on. But those predictions um, of deaths and hospitalizations, they haven't come to pass um, in anything like the numbers that um, were predicted. Uh, I think in England and Wales, the, the, it was thought that there may well be some 3,500 deaths, um, similar predictions around the world. Um, I mean, and there is worrying data on uh, infections, but infections are dependent on testing. And most jurisdictions are only testing those with symptoms. Um, and prisons are saying, well, um, certainly in England and Wales, if you come forward with the symptoms, you'll end up locked up um, in an in a isolation unit and, and never getting out. Um, some prisons were coming forward on the basis that they thought they might get early release. Um, that didn't happen either. So I don't think we really know what's going on. A good example is Marion County, sorry, the Marion Correctional Facility in Ohio. So they tested 2,000 prisoners in Marion, 80% uh, were positive. The vast majority were asymptomatic. So while a lot of jurisdictions, I don't mean this in a pejorative way, but I'm sure it will come across that way, that are saying congratulating themselves for controlling the, the epidemic, um, unless there's mass testing, I don't think we really know what's going on uh, in, in prisons. So I think some of this data is asking more about the virus than maybe about prison management, and maybe that will provoke some questions. But I'm afraid to say, and I, I'm not wanting people to die, I'm not wanting to people to go to hospital, but let's be pragmatic about this, let's be realistic. You know, calls for the release of prisoners based on the effects of the pandemic are not going to be heard whilst uh, this virus is acting in prisons in a way we, we didn't uh, expect. So, but let's, let's look at what is actually going on as far as we know. In England and Wales, the population has gone down as Fergus said, uh, and that's largely because people aren't coming through the court. So the prison population has gone down, but we have 80,000 men, women and children. Let's not use lockdown, are in solitary confinement. We're in lockdown, prisoners are in solitary confinement. Um, as I say, some are barely out of their cells for more than 20 minutes and Peter Clark highlighted, um, I think it was sort of coldingly, where people have been in one unit, have not been out at all for 15 days. Now that's contrary to every human rights standard in the world and the, M and the HMPPS's own, own standards. But within this, there is very little scrutiny of this and I think this is hugely important. I mean, I've used the term out of sight, out of mind, prisons being socially distant. Um, prisons are more out of sight, out of mind now than they have ever been. PPO, Ombudsman, the IMB, largely absent. HMCIP are doing these short scrutiny visits. Uh, and I think it was shameful, and I say the word shameful without hesitation, the Prison Governors Association said that the short scrutiny visits would be uh, uh, un unhelpful. Um, and I think that's, that's entirely wrong. Um, I, as a governor, would welcome inspections. I've been a governor and an inspector. Uh, and they are uh, a healthy uh, part of um, uh, any jurisdiction. And Peter Clark, to be fair, I mean, he's, he's noted there are some good communications, there is reasonable amount of um, compliance from prisoners within this, this solitary confinement. Um, and it was interesting that Peter Clark noted recently in the Justice Select Committee that um, while some governors were trying to offer something, particularly around education, uh, 
uh, they were told by a central command system by which the prison system is currently operating that they weren't allowed any flexibility and I think that's wrong I mean I've run a number of prisons um, I know what these rules are I think there is an opportunity to be flexible this no prison will do anything um, is, is, is entirely wrong and the prison service itself is saying nothing other than through spokespersons um, there's been a lot of research about the effects of solitary confinement um, a lot of it's around in the states um, and if people want to research themselves there's a, a guy I used to work with called Stuart Grassian G-R-A-S-S-I-A-N you can google his work and read you one of the things one of a passage from one of his papers and he says the restriction of environmental stimulation and social isolation associated with confinement in solitary are strikingly toxic to mental functioning producing a stuprous condition associated with perceptual and cognitive impairment and affective disturbances in more severe cases inmates so confined have developed florid delirium confusional psychosis with intense agitation fearfulness and disorganization but even those inmates who are more psychologically resilient inevitably suffer severe psychological pain as a result of such confinement especially when the confinement is prolonged and especially when the individual experience of this confinement as being the product of arbitrary exercise of power and intimidation moreover the harm caused by such confinement may result in prolonged or permanent psychiatric disability including impairments which may seriously reduce the inmates capacity to reintegrate into the broader community upon release from prison now at the moment as far as i'm aware no one is undertaking any evaluation of what's going on in terms of this mass institutional solitary confinement uh, in the english and welsh prison system um, and there's a dimension that no one even Stuart Grassian hasn't looked at we're talking solitary confinement but i think 60 percent of prisoners are in two to a cell so if it's not a i'm not quite sure what the term should be but two person solitary confinement boy we haven't been there um so imagine 23 and a half hours a day in a toilet with someone you've never met and you didn't choose um and anyone looking into this might want to look at the howard league's uh, report on sexual violence for a dimension we probably don't want to consider so there are plans to open up regimes um, and I have, to, I have to say they're opaque, they contain no timelines, they're aspirational, they're not telling us anything. Uh, in the meantime, we've got a thousand prisoners a week leaving the system just routinely. They're not being tested as they go out. Um, what they're going to face in terms of employment and housing and personal relationships, well, it was difficult before and it's even, even worse now. Um, and some research again from the States found that people coming out of these kinds of conditions, 24% were more likely to die in the first year after their release. The risk was particularly acute for certain causes of death. People exposed to solitary confinement, 54% more likely to die from homicide, 78% more likely to die by suicide, um, and 127% uh, more likely to die from an opioid overdose. So we've got a, a prison system trying to solve a problem it hasn't really evaluated and enforcing mass solitary confinement without beginning to understand its implications in custody and after release. Thanks. Charlie, you're silent. You muted, Charlie. It had to happen, didn't it? Um, <laughs> I was struggling with the text boxes and the Q&A. John, thank you so much. And I think that image of the Petri dish is going to probably linger in a lot of people's minds, unfortunately, for a very long time. Um, and it's really interesting to think about what you're saying in light of the most recent MOJ statement with a view to lifting restrictions and what that's going to mean. Um, the issue around inspections has been raised numerous times by numerous groups, particularly the Zayed Mubarak Trust. The issue around data and the fact that no one really knows what's happening in prisons for all the reasons that you've pointed out. Someone in the audience has said that 17 out of 122 prisons are, are virus free at the moment. Some might say that's a brilliant result. Some might say that's really worrying. And the idea of a thousand people leaving prison every week, as you say, and linking back up to what Ferguson John was saying, to go where, supervised by whom, to live in what conditions and to be re-entered into a process of supervision at some point and perhaps breached. The audience are talking about 
electronic monitoring and breach and the risk of there being increased court activity and requirement for prison. Someone asked a question about parole and was it that people that were nearing parole likely to get released as a result when people saw the virus coming? Why have governments since the 1990s been so attached to the overuse of prison? And I think Richard might have something to say about that later. Questions about the risk to pregnant women and how are special conditions or treatment being applied in the light of the virus to high risk groups. So we're going to come back to all of these questions, keep them coming in and keep voting for the ones in particular that you want to see answered. For our final 10 minutes, I'm going to hand over to Pippa Goodfellow, the Director of the Standing Committee of Youth Justice. Pippa, thanks very much. Thanks, Charlie. Thanks, everyone. Um, it's really good to be here. I, I thought initially I'm going to struggle to fit what I've got to say about this into 10 minutes, but having heard all of the really interesting insights from the other speakers, it's given me even more to think about, but I'll do my best. Um, I'm going to actually try and share my screen with you to give you something a little bit different to look at, if that's all right, um, rather than looking at my face for the next 10 minutes. Um, Okay, so yeah, I'm the director of the Standing Committee for Youth Justice. We are an alliance of uh, just over 60 non-profit organisations that work together to try and positively influence youth justice policy um, in England and Wales. So we've obviously had a real interest in the implications for um, children in terms of uh, the social distancing measures, the emergency legislation that's come into force um, and the impact that that's had on children and young people and on the systems um, and organisations that are supporting them. So I'm just going to run through a few thoughts really. First of all, just starting out kind of reframing and reminding ourselves why it is important to consider children as a distinct group um, in terms of these conversations. Um, so when I'm talking about children, when I'm talking about 10 to 17 year olds um, in the youth justice system in England and Wales, um, we know that children that are involved in the youth justice system um, come from multiple types of disadvantage, cumulative disadvantage, and you may say um, that it's incredibly likely that a lot of the inequalities that are being exacerbated by the pandemic in society more broadly are going to have a particular impact on those children and the communities in which they live. So I think it's really important for us to kind of bear that in mind, um, particularly in terms of the fact that any we know from research that any contact with the criminal justice system itself has a negative and criminogenic effect on children particularly when they're at that really young important part of their life stage if we can keep them out of the formal criminal justice system as much as possible um, then that's really important in terms of their future um, and them reaching their potential the other thing to say about children um, as under 18 year olds is that sitting alongside all of the criminal justice um, legislation, they also have pre specific protections around um, their, their own children's rights and um, welfare and in terms of safeguarding protections, which sit alongside that kind of crime and justice frame. Um, and sometimes they sit there quite uncomfortably. Sometimes they come to the fore um, at particular points in time more than others and now when we're thinking about how we, we should be keeping children safe but also making sure um, that they're not getting into trouble I think that's a really important question for us to be kind of considering and holding in mind. The other thing to say in terms of the place of children in these conversations is that the fact that children become involved in the criminal justice system um, is always a, at the, as a result of a decision and cumulative decision making and um, that is made by adults so they are living in a community and within systems and um, where decisions are being made by adults and they're often being made by adults that don't necessarily reflect them their own characteristics and the communities that they're coming from so there's lots of potential there for decisions to be made which will discriminate against particular groups of children and young people and we need to particularly bear that in mind at the moment so in terms of how children and young people's experiences have been throughout the pandemic so far one of the things i would say is that it's quite difficult to establish that because 
as children and young people are in the community, they're being dealt with by lots of supportive agencies, by police, they're going through the courts, some of them are in custody. And um, having that kind of overall transparent oversight in terms of what's happening to children um, is really critical. And I don't think that that's happening um, at the moment. And it's really important that when we come out the other side and start looking at the recovery phrase, um, that we really start looking at that kind of as in terms of those children's journeys right the way through the different parts of the criminal justice system. So just to run over some of the particular issues that we and our members have identified in terms of issues in the community for children. So to start with, communications with children and young people haven't been distinct um, and that potentially is going to have consequences for them. So there haven't been any specific targeted communication campaigns to make sure that children and young people understand the lockdown measures and um, which have potentially criminal consequences for them. So that's really important, I think, in terms of if they're breaching any of those restrictions and um, what has the state actually done to make sure that they understand them with a different developmental stage of understanding. I think in terms of what I touched on earlier, in terms of keeping children safe, there are clearly issues around safeguarding in the community which cross over into potential uh, criminality or entrance into the criminal justice system. So lots of the spaces that young people will normally um, be in and will normally be their place around public spaces, that is particularly at the beginning of the pandemic, those were places that they couldn't inhabit anymore. So they were forced often to be at home and we know because we know a lot about the backgrounds of children that tend to become involved in the criminal justice system, that often home is the least safe place for them and they've increasingly been asked to spend time in that place. So one of the things that we know is that there's potentially lots of issues that are emerging in the home around, for example, um, child to parent violence, um, which we think is a real kind of issue that's potentially bubbling under the surface. And we need to think very carefully about how we deal with that, both from a safeguarding perspective, but also not by um, pushing lots more vulnerable children into the criminal justice system. Another really important thing in, in the community is clearly around the policing of the pandemic and the policing of children and young people. I think it was a real concern at the beginning um, of the lockdown as to what the nature um, of policing would be and the extent to which it was kind of understanding temperate um, and taking into account children and young people's needs. And we don't really have enough of the data to really be able to mine into um, what has really how that's really played out at the moment. But I think particularly in the context of what's happening in America and the way that that's translating into kind of increased activism in this country, policing in a pandemic and protest policing in a pandemic um, is going to be um, particularly interesting um, and we need to be particularly careful about how that um, comes out particularly because a lot of the issues and um, that are coming out in terms of that activism are issues that are really important to young people and they're really important in terms of that sense of justice and the lack of justice in much of our criminal justice system in the way that it disproportionately impacts on particular communities and black and minority ethnic communities. Um, I think that, that it's already been touched on by other speakers, some of the issues around um, the delays in the criminal justice system itself and the fact that we've got um, a significant number of um, under 18 year olds who are currently waiting their day in court or for their processing through the system and there'll clearly be implications in terms of what some of the longer term um, consequences of that are. But I just want to make sure that I leave enough time um, to talk about children in penal custody um, so in the in, in prison for, for want of a better word. Um, so in terms of the number of children that are currently in custody, um, I think as of last week it was 711 children, which is um, the smallest that it's been for I think as long as recent record keeping um, has been and certainly since the youth justice system was um, set up um, around the year um, 2000. One of the things that's really important for us again to hold in mind is that the custody for children was not fit for purpose in the first place. So when we're thinking about how we can navigate our way back to normality, 
normality for children in custody was not a good place to be and there's been numerous independent inspection reports which um, concluded a number of years ago um, that the system for children imprisonment isn't fit for purpose so we must make sure that whatever we do in terms of coming out of this we don't go back to that as being the new normal also in terms of the population of those children that are in custody the fact is is that generally about a quarter of children and it may be higher at the moment are on remand so they haven't been found guilty um, and they're awaiting their day in court and we know that the majority of those children will go on not to get a custodial sentence so they'll either be acquitted or they'll get a community sentence so there's a significant there's hundreds of children that are being held in essentially solitary confinement at the moment who haven't yet been deemed guilty at court of committing that crime. I think that's really important for us to bear in mind. Um, and also the number of children that are in that environment who are looked after children, so they are under the care um, and responsibility of the state. Um, and also, unfortunately, the trend has been over the last 12 years or so that where we've seen a significant drop welcomingly in the number of children that go to prison that has not benefited black and minority ethnic children so there's a particular disparity and inequality in terms of those that are held in detention which we also really need to hold in mind in terms of that pot potential kind of sense of injustice um, around that so we know that there's been some changes in the regime um, and they've come out in recent inspection reports so children are essentially being locked down not doing very much, 23 hours a day, um, they're not getting education, they're not getting all of the rehabilitative um, interventions that surely is the whole point of the reason why they're there at the moment. So I think that we really need to think about what are the longer term consequences for these children? Why haven't any of the early release schemes yet released one child from custody so again there's a policy that's in place there which isn't benefiting children because they haven't been considered in that way as a distinct group um, and really this exemplifies the fact that um, prison is not the right place for children and it's certainly not the right place for them at the moment i'm conscious i've already gone over my time um, but i just on that point about longer term consequences i think what this pandemic has potentially done um, is to give us an opportunity to think about things really differently. So we've seen hotels opening up to homeless people as part of a public health approach. So if we're going to be looking at how all of the different aspects of society can come together to try and keep children out of trouble and keep children out of the criminal justice system, I think we need to kind of pick up on some of that learning about that it's all of our responsibility um, to do that. That's probably enough for me. Thanks, Pippa. I'm sure, you know, I certainly would love to hear much more of what you've got to say. I think the perennial question about whether children can ever be safe in prison stands. Um, the idea that not a single child has been released under the early release scheme remains shocking. And I think the audience is certainly expressing lots and lots of concern and questions across the board from everything that all of you have talked about in terms of black and minoritized groups, health, well-being, and particular exposure and risk in terms of the virus, if not to the criminal justice system. And how is any of that being addressed by any of the particularities that you've addressed? So I'm going to give a quick overview of some of the questions that are outstanding. I want the panellists to bear them in mind and pick particular areas. Then I'm going to invite a couple of questions directly from the audience and then we're going to try. It's unwieldy and I'm not going to pretend it's going to be easy or as Fergus said, particularly satisfying necessarily. But let's give it a go uh, to have some kind of dialogue, if not conversation. So skills and supports for staff, particularly around the supervisory process that staff might benefit from, particularly given the blurred boundaries now that everybody or so many people are working from home. Increasingly punitive approaches and the likelihood, if not the possibility at least, of increased use of prison, either because community sentences, sentences are harder to deliver because they're going to take longer and be in smaller groups, or because judges just think prison is a more useful uh, punishment for people committing potentially more serious crimes. 
the health and children needs of people in the criminal justice system. The fact that 17 out of 122 prisons remain COVID free. The particular risks to pregnant women and dependent infants. Comparisons with the mental health secure estate and whether there's anything that can be learned from looking at those in forensic settings, perhaps. Very usefully, a colleague has sent in, in response to John Podmore, in Marion Correctional Institute, 2,300 prisoners were tested. Unbelievably, 2,028, I hope I've read that right, were positive, 95% of whom were asymptomatic. And that particular colleague's question was government attention to this kind of data and the impact that it holds for everybody, both inside and outside prisons, and how is that being considered? There's a very specific and quite technical question for John Collins about access to open justice and how it's been compromised and some of the contradictions. So John, I'm going to come to you with that at the end. And there's then been a comment about actually there's a new announcement about uh, increased court hearings. So maybe there's something that you can all talk about there. So I know this is a bit of a rush and a bit garble, but some of you will have picked up particular areas of interest. I am going to invite, I think Anton, now, I've never done this before, so don't, oh, I'm going to invite Anton to ask a question. Over to you, Anton. Great. No? Yep. I don't know whether you can hear me or not. Yes, we can uh, now. Is, excellent. My name is Anton Shilopanov. Uh, and when I was just starting out as a baby justice reformer 20 years ago, slightly over 20 years ago, uh, in Eastern Europe, Central Asia, and elsewhere, uh, there was a huge public and prison health crisis around tuberculosis and the third wave of the HIV pandemic, which was largely driven by hyperincarceration and the cycle of uh, the infection being amplified in uh, overcrowded and hygienic uh, prison conditions and being reflected into society in that cycle uh, being perpetual. Um, and a lot of work was done to try and address this. Uh, jurisdictions and people who worked in those jurisdictions discovered eventually with a lot of uh, uh, with a lot of encouragement that uh, reducing the number of people in in the justice system uh, and uh, reducing the involvement of people in the justice system was a good way of reducing the cycle of infection but one thing that we really struggled with as I'm sure colleagues here will recognize in 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 all settings I think is uh, to ensure that, uh, well, on a day-to-day -day basis, to, to ensure that uh, justice-involved people are seen first and foremost as citizens, and the citizens of a society which you want to be healthy, uh, and you don't want loads of people dying from preventable causes in. Um, and more specifically, in this pandemic, which is an exacerbation of all sorts of crises, as we have seen, and certainly uh, of the crisis of health inequalities, and overcrowding and, and poor, poor, poor living conditions, both in uh, confinement and in society. Um, how, this is, this is an open question, uh, and it's not been answered very easily in the past, how can we ensure that since this is first and foremost a medical crisis, that justice involved people who are more likely to be immunocompromised, that they're seen first and foremost as people who are at medical risk, at health risk, uh, and people who are already sick, that they're seen first and foremost as patients, and that health needs and uh, public health needs are prioritized in this, in this particular uh, crisis. Charlie, can I uh, take that one? Sure, John, thank you. Go for uh, it. Th th thanks, Anton. I, I think we've both been sort of looking at similar issues for, for, for kind of many years now. And I, and I think um, certainly what I've been trying to put forward in this current, current crisis is the, is, is the concept who's in prison. Um, and this is members of the community passing through um, and many passing through 
for only a very short period of time. So what happens in prison doesn't, doesn't stay in prison. And any uh, health problem in prison is going to have come in from the community and will go back out to the, to the community. Uh, and the basic principle across the world is that there should be um, equivalence in terms of uh, health services and, and health care. Now we know, we know that that, that, that isn't, isn't happening. Um, but it goes back to this kind of social distancing. What we have to do is keep reminding the public that people in prison are members of the community passing through. Uh, you, know, you mentioned TB. Well, I had a, a TB outbreak when I was uh, governor of Brixton. Um, I, I lost two members of staff and two prisoners. Um, and you know, to say it was a major problem is kind of, kind of understating it. Um, I had a very good relationship with the Lambeth uh, Primary Care Trust, as it was in those days. Uh, and we brought in um, a mobile uh, chest x-ray um, vehicle um, and believe me getting that through the gates of Brixton prison that was designed for a horse and cart was somewhat difficult but we brought it into the prison uh, and we uh, we x-rayed every single prisoner uh, and we made it available to staff um, and because uh, I mean the, the, the medics will have to sort of help me on this but you can do very close genetic monitoring of types of TB um, and you can do, you know, track and trace with TB has been around for a long period of time um, and is very, very effective. Um, and we were able to, to deal with it. We were able not only to deal with it, but use the prison as a way of helping the kind of the TB stuff that was and still is around. And, and we forget there are I think it was like three, four million people a year are dying from 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 TB. The TB is a is a is a is a major issue in uh, one of the many major medical issues in um, in, in prison. Um, but you know, with HIV, we, we kind of struggled with ne uh, needle sharing, and, and I worked out in Mauritius where they were building a new prison for those with HIV. So so attitudes were were, were very difficult. But in terms of you know how we deal with medical problems we have to deal with it on the basis that people are coming in and out of prison and why with all this testing and prisons being covid free at the moment i think is um is a dangerous term to use the very least that should be being done at the moment is that all prisoners being released a thousand a week should be be, be tested but it, it's it, it's getting over to the general public that it's mem who's in prison members of the community passing through brilliant Thanks, John. Fergus, I know you've got a lot to say about this. I'll try and be really brief, but I think in a sense the, the answer to the question is quite straightforward. So we, we, all, we already knew pre-COVID that uh, prisons and to some extent criminal justice are not very good for your health and they're not very good for public health. Uh, in in general terms and they're also mildly criminogenic right so uh, we, we, we use a system of uh, coercive state power in order to respond to conflict and harm that the conflict and harm that crime represents and we do it insufficiently judiciously we're not um, we're nowhere near sufficiently parsimonious or proportionate in the way that we apply those kinds of penalties to people the way that we apply that form of state power in ways which damage those people subject to it and which damage the well-being of communities more generally. What COVID does is throw that into sharp relief, just as previous um, health crises related to tuberculosis or HIV have, have done it at different times in the past um, and in different countries. So for me, the, the, the key kind of uh, general point that emerges in, in different ways from all the present presentations is that this is a moment to fundamentally recalibrate the way that we think about proportionality, about risk and about public protection. All of the normal ways of thinking about that, which were already faulty, are kind of exposed cruelly by the pandemic. So the risks aren't flowing in the directions that we think and they're not being borne or carried by the people that we usually think. Um, it's prison staff and probation staff that might be carriers of the virus as they move between clients and between places of work and places of residence and places of commerce. Um, so the, the, the logical conclusion is that we need to use this opportunity to focus on maximum diversion from the exercise of 
state coercive state power in response to crime um, and conflict and we've got such an opportunity here that just as, as we were talking i was following the conversation on twitter too and the scottish prison population is down 15 percent probation caseloads will also decline because of the reduction in court business we mustn't fill that back up either in the prison or the community rather we could deploy the money we could deploy the human resources in the correctional system for want of a better expression uh, to support diversionary measures uh, that respond more constructively to, to to crime so i would i would say rather than assuming that we get our courts back up and running and we process all the cases that are waiting Let's go back to the prosecutors and remark those cases and reconsider how many of them need to go to court in the first place. Um, and, that, and let's expend the resource that we save tackling those cases in other ways, a bit like in the Scottish youth justice system or in the children's hearing system. A few years ago, we developed a whole system approach which basically exists to ensure that young people get what they need without having been formally processed through a system that subjects them to mandate and, and coercive state power. So, you know, to, to put it in the, in the language of the Howard League's sort of priorities and, and policies, this is a moment to stem the flow. And we, we can choose to do that. Or we can just return to business as normal, except that it's not normal, because the punishments that we will be imposed will be even more disproportionate, even more risky to the people subject to them and to the rest of the population. So to fail to divert is now, clearly, to fail to protect the public. Thanks, Fergus. Pippa, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, I just had a comment to kind of echo the point about maximum diversion and just to say that lots of the organisations that can work um, either exclusively or alongside the statutory criminal justice um, sector are voluntary sector organisations that have got that are rooted in communities that have got specific expertise around their communities and how to engage effectively with them. And I think one of the things that we really need to bear in mind in terms of this is that lots of those organisations currently are in quite precarious financial situations, depending on the way that they're funded. And there's real concerns about whether or not they're still going to be around as we come out the other end of this, but potentially they've got a really, really important role to play in terms of maximising that diversion and stemming the flow in a, community-based, culturally appropriate way. Okay, John, I know you want quickly just to add a last comment on that and then we'll move on to the next questions. I think two things, just very briefly. One is that um, on the broader point about, about how the system deals with, with health issues, I mentioned in my presentation that sentences need to consider the impact of uh, a sentence on the individual and obviously the, the potential risk of particularly some of can't hear you, John. Sorry, can you hear me now? Uh, yeah. Um, so I think at the sentencing stage and potentially at the remand stage, the, the potential risk of infection in a custodial institution does need to be borne in mind by sentences when they're thinking about the impact of the order they're making. But I do think it's worth considering the extent to which that needs to be borne in mind for all people coming in front of the court and potentially more specifically for those people who might be more vulnerable. And some of the guidance that has been around sentencing has said you need to think about people maybe with some substance misuse problems, people who are homeless, who may be more prone to infection. And I think that individualization of risk by comparison with the sort of general look at the overall health of the custodial population is a really interesting challenge for sentences and relies on getting high quality, accurate information on the individual in a pre-sentence report so they can make those finely balanced decisions. And the second thing also very briefly is just that um, on, on Fergus's point about not just getting all the cases and shoving them through as quickly as possible, I think it is interesting that during this period, the police and the CPS have issued new guidance aligned with the, the Code for Crown Prosecutors around focusing on the most serious cases um, and looking at uh, only those cases that really need to be prosecuted. It'd be interesting to see what lessons they can learn from that in terms of where they have looked again at cases and decided to divert people in these circumstances. Would that have been the right decision to do anyway once they've reviewed those cases? And is the things they can learn while still ensuring from our point of view the cases that should be dealt with in court are? But I think at this time when they have tried to divert more out, uh, there's something probably to learn from that. Thanks, John. I am not going to lie. I thought I had quite a good uh, 
ADHD tendency towards lots of different open screens at once. But this is a challenge, I'm going to admit. So, John, I've asked for there are about five specific questions for you from the audience. I've asked for them to be collated, but I can't read them, read them to you, ask other people's questions and involve everybody at the same time. So bear with me, they're on their way. In the meantime, I am going to ask Gargi, Gargi, to ask a question she's brought in. It had to happen, but Gargi wants to talk about police. So Gargi, if you are ready, I'm going to ask your question. I'm going to ask panellists in exactly the same way we just did, brief as possible, because I think we're going to get Gargi's question, and then maybe one or two more. We've got the next question lined up. So Gargi, over to you. Thank you very much. Oh, yes. Um, so my question is uh, coming from my own experience. I'm in India right now, and our police forces, like much like the other police forces, are deeply bigoted and much prejudiced against members of minority communities, the poor, the daily wagers. So right now in a pandemic situation, is using them as key members of public health policy a good idea? Or does it just work to worsen the situation of already over-policed groups, such as the blacks in Africa, um, the blacks in America, I'm sorry. Uh, in India, we have the Muslims, the minorities, all of them being even more uh, hounded in this situation. So that's my question. Thanks, Gargi. So, Fergus, do you want to take that first? Very briefly, I'm no expert on policing, so I, I speak only with a, a lay person's uh, understanding of these issues, really. But um, I think a, a lot depends on the nature of policing and the perception of the legitimacy of policing in the communities that we're discussing. And that, that isn't uniform, uh, even within a country, never mind between countries. Um, I would say, though, that we had, in, in the Scottish context, uh, the, the Scottish police uh, pioneered a violence reduction unit which used public health approaches to some great effect. Uh, however, the, one of the leaders of that initiative, John Carnahan, famously uh, said in response to a media question on one occasion, he would rather that money was spent on health visitors than on police officers. And coming from a senior police officer, that was a very powerful intervention in Scottish um, debates about uh, how to respond to, to crime and violence um, and I think he's right so I think it, it's good to reform and change the way that we think about policing it's good to think about the, the ways in which communities themselves at grassroots level can come up with modalities of conflict resolution that don't require the coercive power of the state to be employed through police services um, and it's good to get money out of criminal justice altogether uh, to find more constructive ways to respond to social harm. Um, but the, the precise form of change that might be required is going to be different in different contexts. And I know nothing about Indian policing and so I can't directly respond to the question uh, in, in that context. But um, I, I certainly agree with the sentiment behind it. Thank you, Fergus. I don't know, John, Pippa? John, do you want to respond at all to Gargi's question? You may not. John, yeah, you... Yeah, 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 yes, I would. Not, not least having spent some, some wonderful time sort of out in India doing, doing, doing some training, so I have a, a great, great affinity. Um, but, but I think what, what this pandemic is, is, is doing is kind of highlighting um, problems that were potentially already there. Um, I mean, I think where there have been good um, police community relations, I think they will come to the fore in this kind of scenario. I think where the relationships have been poor, um, yeah, yeah and, and we've seen stuff in the States, but you know, we've seen some, you know, relatively speaking, very minor stuff in, in, in England and Wales, particularly on Twitter, where we've seen the police um, doing some, shall we say, odd community policing. Um, and where, I think where there is cooperation, um, it will be enhanced. But I think where there is there has been a, breakdown relationship in the past, I think the pandemic can be an opportunity, shall we say, for uh, doing, um, shall we say, more inappropriate things. I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Thanks, John. Pippa? Yeah, I think the police need to be part of the approach. Everybody needs to be part of the approach. Um, from a children and young people's perspective, police have got a role to play in keeping them safe. 
So some of the safeguarding concerns that I was describing earlier, some of the increasing concerns about what's happening to children that are being exploited in various ways. The police have a role to play in protecting them. Trust in police and the fact that police are doing child-centered, community-based policing with the intention of preventing crime and reframing how they see their role in preventing crime as being about building trust, being about you know, establishing those relationships with all of the different partners in the community. But whatever resource and effort is thrown at police in terms of responding to issues around crime um, needs to be matched by investment in the services that the police can actually play a really helpful role in signposting to, to supportive services, to social care, to mental health, to health, to housing. And police have got a frontline role to play. And if what they can do is be one of the agencies that's out there in the community that is able to signpost into those other services, those other services also need to have an equitable level of investment so that they can respond effectively. Otherwise, we're only ever going to get a punitive response if supportive responses aren't available. Thank you. And I suppose it brings us right back to the kind of fundamental principles around the design of what, what criminal justice services are about. What is the police force for? And is it ever going to be able to function in the way that you describe? Um, we've got the Q&A has been busy. There's a question very close to my heart, which you might all want to think about in your particular context, which we'll come back to at the end around contact with families for people in prison and how that's been affected and what particular attention is being paid, particularly for children in contact with incarcerated parents or for incarcerated children having visits with family members. But before we do that, John, I've sent you the collated list of particular questions for you. You've got around six minutes to be working out how you're going to answer all of them briefly. We'll come back to that as well. And in the meantime, I'm going to ask Kirsty Kitchen, who's got a question, I think, about use of data and particular groups. So, Kirsty, welcome. Thank you. Um, so yes, uh, I'm Kirsty Kitchen, I'm Head of Policy at Birth Companions, so we are specialists in supporting pregnant women and new mothers in the criminal justice system. Um, my, my point followed by a question was um, sort of the fact that data and transparency have been raised in various guises in most parts of this conversation so far today. Um, and I sort of was keen for us all to reflect on the fact that there is a such a lack of data on specific cohorts in prison um, that has been a problem in shaping the services that are provided in prison contexts in, in terms of um, scrutinising the way that those uh, parts of the system operate. And that's been going on for a very, very, very long time um, and something that many of us have challenged from, from our own perspectives throughout this. I think the pandemic has shown how debilitating that lack of data and transparency um, really are when push comes to shove. So my question, I suppose, is for us all to reflect on how can we collectively use this as an opportunity to push uh, particularly the prison and probation service and MOJ to fundamentally change their approach to data on specific groups from our point of view, pregnant women and, and new mothers. But um, BAME communities, um, traveller communities, uh, etc., older, older people, children and young people in these settings, and, and to really start to balance the confidentiality issues that they often hide behind when, when asked for data on these groups um, with the wider public health responsibilities and health and justice responsibilities that, that they are tasked with. Thanks, Kirsty. Not a simple question. I'm going to ask panellists to bear in mind both the complexity of that added to the fact that we have around six minutes. So, Fergus? Yeah, I, I'll try and be brief again. Um, <laughs> I, I, it's, a, it's a huge question and I don't know uh, the details of the kind of the data that is routinely collected or not collected in the context of England and Wales. It sounds to me, though, like that this this is a, again a moment to try to build a coalition of of people who are going to continually lobby uh, 
um, for that information to be in the public domain and for guidance uh, to be further developed and refined to take into account the additional uh, impacts, the additional suffering effectively caused by imposing imprisonment in the context of the pandemic. I, I see that Nikki Padfield's part of the conversation in the background asking questions and I know that she's talking or part of a, a, another seminar later today but um, I wonder as well if, if this isn't an issue for the Sentencing Council to be thinking about issuing advice or even guidelines to sentencers to say, look, if, if, if the experience of punishment, uh, imprisonment rather, is now an experience of cellular confinement, and that's going to be the case for the foreseeable future, then we must discount sentence lengths. There's, there's, it, it's a, to me, that's a kind of no-brainer on proportionality grounds. Uh, and that applies across all groups, not just to the specific group mentioned here who have particular vulnerabilities or for whom there are other factors that have to be considered in making those kinds of calculations. So, um, yeah, I think we just need to sort of stand up and make the argument together. Right. And I think I know John's got a question about Sentencing Council and Magistrates Association hooking up already. So I wonder if he could add that on his little list. Of things to talk to sentencing council about. We'll come to you, John. Don't worry, Pippa. Yeah, I just um, it makes me think of a conversation that really stuck with me that I had about five years ago with a group of uh, young people who had experience of the justice system. When we asked a similar question, they said they always seem to have data when they want to use it against us. So it's there. It's it's just how it's being collated and how it's being published. Absolutely. I think that's um, very wise. Um, John, your mic's off. No, it's not. You're going to ready to go. Yeah, yeah. It, it's um, yeah. I, I mean, illustrative of the problem was, uh, and of course, we'll know this that until relatively recently, um, the prison service was asked, "How many pregnant women have you got in prison?" And they didn't know, um, and which is scandalous. Um, they didn't know. Is it because they didn't care? What is that about? Um, it, it, it's a huge problem. Uh, the, uh, the lack of transparency from the prison service, I think, is, 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 is well known. Um, we are fortunate that, that we do have the NPM, the National Preventive Mechanism. I think that's an excellent body. Um, it works very, very well. And, and it's up to um, all the participants in the NPM and people like the Justice Select Committee um, to, to, to ask these questions and demand the answers. But the problem is they ask the questions, they don't get the answers, and there's no accountability. But because but, um, he's absolutely right, that there's a huge amount of data. I mean, they'll peddle out um, mandatory drug testing figures, which, which mean next to nothing. But um, knowing how many pregnant women, how many women uh, with babies are there in prison, I think is kind of important. I've often said I would love to see a voluntary sector service get away with some of the responses and some of the approaches and practices that statutory services and government departments seem to use as daily operations. So, John, you've got literally two minutes to answer the list of questions that were for you. Go. Thank you, Charlie. So uh, on the data one, first of all, which we've just had very briefly, magistrates' courts have long been um, something of a data black hole. There's not very much information on what happens beyond the most basic caseloads and various bits of research, the Lamy Review and others have highlighted that. It's something that we think there needs to be better data capture. And if anything um, can be done about that as part of the current reform, court reform program, that'd be really positive and we'd be really supportive of that. Um, in terms of the questions that have been asked, the first one is around open justice um, and the implications of the pandemic for open justice, um, which uh, I mentioned briefly in passing. But I think the reality is, is that in the current circumstances, it is much more difficult for the average person on the street to go and visit a court and sit in the public gallery and watch what's going on. That's just the reality of being in the situation we're in. Um, I, so I, but I do think that in that circumstance, particular attention needs to be given to ensuring that where people do turn up, they are able to access courts, which is, they should be able to, so that needs to be made clear. Um, but also in ensuring media access, so um, where members of the press want to get access either face-to-face -face or remotely, and um, they're able to do so. And I think that the bigger issue around open justice is around the increased use of video links and remote hearings, um, and in the future potentially entirely virtual 
hearings where no one's in a courtroom or where any of the judiciary is. Um, and where that does happen, certainly there needs to be clear routes to access for, for the press, but there should be for the public as well. And that may be a technological challenge to manage as well as a practical one, but I don't think you can just say it's too difficult and therefore you can't do it. So they're finding their way during the pandemic and I accept that, but I think longer term they need to find solutions to this problem. Um, on uh, next question is, will we work with the Sentencing Council on a whole range of issues that, um, that have been discussed? Yes, absolutely. I think there is a role for the Council here. I think there was someone due to attend from the Council. So if they're here, um, it'd be great to get in touch and talk about this. I think there is work to be done, um, particularly if, um, if, as some have said, the sort of current conditions in prison are going to carry on for a long period. I think you need something more substantial to help sentences with what are actually very difficult decisions, balancing a number of different factors on custody and the community. Um, and then the last question in my list was around um, a concern about video participation um, and uh, telephone hearings and uh, them becoming default. I think I've said what my concerns are about that. The one thing I, I think is really important to remember is that by and large, in most cases, particularly once we start to move out of the more stringent lockdown measures, the decision about whether or not a case can be heard remotely or face-to-face -face is a judicial decision. It's up to the judge or the bench of magistrates to decide if that's appropriate and whether or not it'll enable participation if they appear remotely. And I think that our members and the paid judiciary need to take that responsibility seriously. And I think we need to think about how we provide them with training and knowledge to, so they can make those decisions about where it is and isn't appropriate uh, to use um, video technology in particular cases with the, I think the understanding that there are compromises with both, both, both approaches, but that in the end, participation and fairness has to be the underlying aim of the system and has to be what's prioritised. Thanks, John. Well done. That was pretty good going. I've now got about 28 seconds to say, Sam, Sarah, Malcolm, Barry, Roma, Tara, Vinny, Karen, Peter, Stephen, Margaret, Gemma, Jane, Daniel, Ed, sorry we didn't get all of your questions asked and or answered. We did our very best to everyone who's joined today. Thank you so much to our panellists. Thank you for your kindness, generosity, patience, engagement. We're going to do our best to compile as much of this as possible in the most user-friendly format. We'll send the link to Fergus's blog and there are two more of these to go. So on behalf of everyone at CCJS, Thanks very much indeed, and we look forward to seeing you next week. All the very best.